Uh, good afternoon. This, uh, this is the second in the webinar series on teaching the Middle East. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the last one that we did last week. This is a three-part series. And um, w w my name is Steve Armstrong. I'm the social studies um, consultant for the State Department of Education. And we're co-sponsoring these webinars with, um, with the peer program at Yale University. And uh, Margaret Marcotte. Margaret, do you have a couple words to say? Sure. I'd like to join you, Steve, in welcoming everybody. Um, and we are located here at Yale, as Steve said, at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Um, our, this particular webinar is on uh, teaching in the Middle East. We hope to have one, well, we will have one in the spring on teaching on Africa as well. Um, so without further ado, why don't we just get right into that webinar? And, and the, the only thing uh, that I would say before we turn it over to Sam is if, if you have specific questions, like there's something you don't understand or you'd like the presenter to talk a little more, just write, them in the, write any question that you have in the chat box and we'll have the presenter, um, we'll have the presenter uh, answer the question. So if each of the presenters, when they begin to speak, if they could introduce themselves. Uh, so Sam, take it away. Okay, um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Um, so my name is Sam Roth. I'm a PhD candidate in Islamic studies at Yale University, and I work on uh, interpretation of the Quran in the modern, primarily the modern Middle East. Um, I also lived in the region for about six years. I was in Jordan from 2005 to 2011, uh, where I uh, taught Arabic, and also um, I worked as the uh, science and technology editor for Islamica magazine, which is sort of like, a, you know, sort of covered the Muslim world, but especially the Arab Middle East. Um, so I'm excited to be with you today. Our topic, uh, the second of the, our three-part webinar, which is Economics and Politics of the Middle East. Um, and if you can do next slide, please. Next slide, Steve. Uh, you can see our agenda for today. Uh, it's a, probably going to be a little bit more on politics, the, uh, the third item on your list, a little bit less on economics, because there's more to talk about there. But basically, we do some content and then teaching strategies with my colleagues, and then more content and then more teaching strategies with my colleagues, and then some time for Q&A. So please feel free to ask any questions you have using the chat box. Um, we'll probably delay most of the Q&A to the end, but if you have a clarificatory question, you know, what does that word mean, or I, I didn't catch that, or, or you bubbled something, uh, please, by all means, feel free to type a question in. Um, so uh, we'll start off with uh, how I'd like to begin often, which is sort of a prior knowledge quiz. So next slide. Um, now, I don't have the liberty, it's a bit tricky with a webinar to manage all of this. In class or in person, I would do this. Um, this is a question that I posed to an in-service uh, group that we had at Connecticut uh, State, uh, Central Connecticut State University uh, about two months ago or so, actually more than that, I think four months, on the same topic, uh, teaching the Middle East. And so one of the questions I started with is, compared to other regions, the Middle East is above average in wealth due to its large oil reserves. So let's take a moment to think about it and decide if you think that's true or false or not sure. I'll give you a moment. All right, Steve, take a uh, next slide, Steve. Take away those the spirits, yeah. So here we have, this is the re answers we got uh, four months ago. Notice uh, many teachers are predisposed to be wary of trick questions, so many people were quite suspicious, 55% said false. Um, now this is a common image that people have of the Middle East, and it's one that we need to problematize a little bit. It certainly has an element of truth. So next slide. You know, this is sort of an iconic image of Dubai. This is unbelievable. This is what can be produced by massive amounts of oil wealth. If you can imagine that none of this existed a century ago, or if there did, there might have been a few buildings, but certainly not like this. So there definitely are these extreme cases of fantastic construction uh, that's been accomplished with incredible amounts of oil money. Next slide. Another crazy example. Uh, this is a view from the mall in Dubai, and you can see in the mall they have built an indoor ski slope. So there in the heat of the Gulf, you know, it might be 120 degrees outside Fahrenheit, and you can go skiing indoors, and how are they refrigerating this room? How are they getting the water to freeze well? Massive amounts of electricity running massively powerful air conditioning. Uh, so yes, yes, you do have these kinds of projects, and, and they certainly do exist, but it is not the entire Middle East. Um, so next slide. Um, if you look here, it's a nice map of proven oil reserves, and you can see uh, there are significant reserves to be found in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, definitely the Gulf states, Bahrain, Qatar, those sorts of places. Um, also Libya, the sort of yellowish area on North Africa there. Um, but lots of the region doesn't have any, doesn't have any oil. Uh, Egypt has almost none. Uh, Syria has a little bit, uh, but not much. Jordan has next to nothing. Um, and I, I can't even remember when I was in Jordan. I mean, this would be the occasion of conspiracy theories. 
because I would meet, you know, residents of Jordan, and they would say, this doesn't make any sense. Iraq has oil. Saudi Arabia has oil. Syria has some oil. Why don't we have any oil? Uh, you know, maybe they're hiding it from us. And, and it's not being hidden as far as we know. It's just that the geology of the region is complicated, and that's how it all worked out. Um, so that's my way of saying that if you live in Egypt or if you live in uh, Lebanon, for example, the economic situation is quite different. Uh, so next slide, Steve. Uh, you can see here, this is the GDP per capita. Uh, Qatar is off the charts, $98,000 per person. Uh, to give you a sense of perspective, the United States is somewhere around 50000 It varies a little bit. So Qatar is maybe double the U.S. GDP per capita. Uh, a lot of the Gulf states are comparable to the U.S., Kuwait, and the Emirates number is three there. Um, Israel has a large number, not from oil, uh, but from uh, high tech and things like that. But if you go down towards the bottom, look at Yemen, $1,500. That is, an extreme, I mean, that's something you might associate with the sub, with, uh, with India or Bangladesh or a place like this. Morocco also very low, Egypt very low. So the reality of, of the situation is quite diverse, uh, from very wealthy to very poor. Um, and in those countries that don't have a lot of oil reserves, they depend on other things. And so, for example, Egypt, uh, a lot of its income is from agriculture, uh, things grown on the Nile River Valley. Uh, Jordan and Turkey have large textiles, and Turkey, to some extent, uh, some agriculture also in Jordan and the Jordan River Valley. North Africa has a lot of fishing, but of course those don't produce money like oil produces money. Uh, next slide. Um, now, there are a lot of economic problems in the region. So if you look here, unemployment and youth, um, it's really staggering. Um, there are significant challenges to boosting the economic status of the region. Uh, among them is the unemployment rate. Look at some of these rates. Population under 25, 51% in Saudi Arabia, 50% in Egypt. These are huge numbers. Uh, and we'll be talking about this more in the second half of our webinar today. This obviously has big implications for the political stability of the region. But certainly, uh, unemployment is a major problem. Economic growth is a problem. Uh, the IMF estimated in 2011, for the past 30 years, it had about half a percent annually, which is very little growth. Um, exports have been flat. Uh, there's a big problem with corruption. Next slide. Um, so there are perceived corruption indices. You can see, I mean, in many ways, it's really the United States, Canada, and Western Europe that are anomalies. Most of the world has this problem. Uh, most of the world, their citizens or their, their, their subjects or whatever the case may be, residents, uh, don't regard their state as particularly uh, lacking in corruption. So whether you're in Mongolia or you're in Algeria or you're in Peru, these perceptions are similar. That said, there are some extreme cases. I've noticed that the dark red, which is the, the greatest level of perceived corruption, there are several states in the region that have this problem. So you can see Iraq there, you can see Syria there, you can see Yemen there highlighted. Um, that obviously is a big barrier to economic growth uh, because it's difficult to find foreign direct investment when people are worried about uh, corruption problems. Now we might also add to this next slide, um, brain drain, big issue. Uh, you have very smart people coming out of the Middle East. I heard once, I should probably confirm this, of course, saying this in a webinar, but I'll throw it out there. You can check it. I've heard that Palestinians have a, among the highest rates of uh, doctorates per capita. Uh, so there's definitely an interest in education in the region. But many people, when they go abroad, they don't come back. So take a look here. Um, you know, many countries are similar. This is not that different. I mean, I suppose if you're from the Philippines, you're not that different from someone from Lebanon. Uh, more than half of people studying the United States from the Middle East don't go back to their home countries for a PhD. And there are some extreme cases. Look at Iran, you know, it's in pink, you can see it there, among the highest levels of people not interested in returning back to their home country. Um, there is a noticeably small number next to Saudi Arabia. You can see that there. That's a success story in avoiding the brain drain, but otherwise it is a big problem. And, and these things have all led to, uh, you might say, a general degree of economic stagnation in the region. Uh, which has caused problems we'll talk about in the second half. Um, we're going to keep it short. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, and I'll come back with politics in a little bit. Okay, this is Liberty Fitzpatrick. Can you hear me all right? I mean, I assume you can hear me. Yeah, no one else is on right now to tell me so. But um, I'm a middle school teacher at Woodbury Middle School. I've been teaching the Middle East to seventh graders for a number of years now. And my portion of the program is going to talk kind of big picture on what it's like to teach some of these issues to middle school students. Um, and so I'm going to touch somewhat on economics. Um, and talk a little bit about how um, how we approach these kind of heavy topics and complex topics with 10 to 13-year-olds. 
Um, so uh, move to the first slide, please. Um, why is teaching the Middle East difficult? Um, teaching geography or perhaps you know history, ancient history is relatively safe, but um, many teachers get a little nervous when we start to talk about um, contemporary issues in the Middle East and um, veer away from them or um, wonder how they're going to approach it with young people. Um, and so I was thinking about what, um, what is it that frightens people? Um, and you have made some of your own ideas, but I have um, three bullets here about why teaching the Middle East to 10 to 13 year olds is difficult. Um, first of all, that the media coverage really focuses is looking at the region as a potential threat to the US. And so it also will contain information that might be personally disturbing to young people. Um, just literally, it's not something that an 11 year old um, can necessarily handle some of the things that we see in the media about the Middle East. Um, and so we worry about that as teachers. Um, the, also the public sources um, really aren't targeted to young people's level of uh, background knowledge. Um, and you can argue about what the adult level of background knowledge is, but um, for sure, uh, most 10 to 13 year olds don't have a whole lot of background knowledge about this region. And thirdly, stereotypes, misunderstandings, and really value judgments um, which is connected to the other two, about the region really abound among the adults. And that does impact how open kids are to learning. Um, and I just want to, a side note here, I have some little yellow boxes in a number of the slides, um, just kind of extra think questions. And um, if you are, you know, in a conversation or able to have a conversation online in the Q&A with anybody else that's on there, or, you know, if you, work with somebody else there. There's just some extra questions in there. You could, that could spark your own discussion, but I won't go on um, about those pieces. So given that the Middle East is so difficult to, um, to teach, you know, should we just give up and say, well, we don't want to do anything controversial? Um, next slide, please. please. Um, I think those same reasons that make it difficult to teach um, is also why it's so important that we do. Um, the, um, and here are four reasons that we should teach. It is definitely relevant in our, in our students' lives and the lives of future citizens. Um, learning needs to be age appropriate. So um, they need the kinds of activities that a school and a group of peers and a teacher who's attendant to you know, their developmental level uh, can provide to them. You know, a newspaper or the evening news is not always age appropriate for these kids. Um, and they need to also be in an atmosphere where they can ask these difficult questions, and I'll have some in the PowerPoint soon, um, that adults have um, an obligation to answer and to discuss in a, um, in a uh, civil way within the classroom, instead of either what many adults do is just sort of laugh at the kid, and the kid has no idea why, um, why the adult thinks it's funny what they asked, um, and they certainly don't get an answer from it sometimes. Um, and just lastly, I mean, kids need to figure this out. Um, anything that's so difficult that we can't figure out, they're going to be left with, and we need to do everything we can to prepare them to solve these difficult, you know, global issues. Next slide. Um, so a lot of what I think we need to teach about the Middle East and about economics also is really not content teaching. Um, we need to develop their ability to access this knowledge. and. We need to, as some of the other presenters have talked about, address those stereotypes. Um, and just like accessing prior, prior knowledge, that's the way we open the door to new learning. Developing empathy, just like in ELA, we're supposed to make a connection when we read. Um, it helps them make real meaning and develop their background knowledge. And also we need to connect the issues to universal concepts. And so even if we don't care about the Middle East, we do care about some of these other universal concepts, such as, next slide. Oh, poverty, war, refugees, nationalism, ethnic identity. These are issues that will happen throughout history, have happened throughout history, and will happen um, in places other than the Middle East. So the extent that we can make connections to these, um, we can um, deepen our, our kids' understanding of the world. Next slide. So here, just a little drill down. Um, if we want them to understand the poverty in the Middle East, um, the statistics that Sam gave us as an adult, we get a sense of, we have some kind of a sense of what those mean when we compare it to the U.S. That helps us 
Um, but for a kid, doesn't really know what poverty is for the most part. They don't not sure whether they're poor or their next door neighbor is poor. And what does that really mean? Is it what is the relative nature of poverty? Um, how does society deal with poverty? Who's obligated to help somebody? Um, and again, those kinds of questions with war and with nationality or immigration, which is certainly a big issue right now. Um, next slide. Um, so here are some questions you could just imagine a child asking and um, could be about the Middle East, it could be about other places, um, but these are the kind of questions that we want as teachers to actually be able to address instead of just kind of roll our eyes and laugh at. Um, so my, my questions there are, um, which of these comments are showing a lack of understanding of economics? How could understanding economics help them? to make sense of um, what's going on, and um, which of these could really start a, a thoughtful discussion. Um, when a kid says something like, um, why can't we just print more money? I think all of us as kids, as kids just wondered that. Like, oh, people are poor, just give them money. And at a 10 to 13 year old in the concrete phase of their development, just moving into abstract thinking, that is, um, that just, is, is a typical question, and we need to start to find ways to answer that before they get to like economics in high school. Okay, next slide. Um, I made some green bubbles because I thought, well, the other ones are kind of negative. These are equally naive, but nice and kind um, to the people in the Middle East. Um, yeah, they can come over here, sure. There's an empty house down my street. Why don't they just move in? That'd be fine. Um, so the naivete about understanding of things that are essentially economic um, will make our kids really not be able to make sense of the information they get from the Middle East. Okay. So um, then lastly, I have three types of activities which are pretty different um, from one another, but all take this kind of approach of our main goal is to um, develop some foundational non-content skills that allow them to access, say, news coverage or other kinds of public media. So next slide. The first one is a refugee simulation activity, um, which you can, um, can read through, but a quick version is kids come to my classroom and the door is locked and I have, you know, the police officer SRO kind of lurking around. I'm very serious. I give them a pass. And I say they can't come in the room, they need to leave all their stuff on the floor, and they need to come back at this certain time, here's their pass, I give a little snip of it. Um, and they need to go read in somebody else's classroom, but come back in 20 minutes and dump all their stuff. Um, and we, um, when they do come back, um, next slide there, we ask them to talk about what their experience was. Um, you know, it's all a surprise to them, and they come back, and I secretly say, okay, it was a setup. We planned the whole thing, and they experience, had some of the experiences of being a refugee. So we're building empathy, and these are the kind of things that they say. This was just cut and pasted from one activity um, that I took notes while they were talking. And the questions that they had when they were just kind of unceremoniously not allowed to go back home, um, the questions that they had and the worries they had and the experience they had um, allow them to understand what it's like to be a refugee. So instead of just seeing a number or when they do see a number about the number of refugees, they have a sense of what that actually really means. Um, and so next slide. The next two are um, more economic space. Kids' understanding of money is super concrete. Um, they don't understand that cost is different than value in 10 to 13 year olds. Um, so they don't understand that the prices of things change. They don't um, understand that how badly people want things alters what they pay for it. So we do a silent auction um, where some things, identical items go for different costs and um, other things where people get like an incredible deal or they pay too much. Uh, and so next slide. Um, and this is just a little more about how you would run this um, and the implications. When we have that joint experience, we can go back to it again and again as we start to look at um, the real data, news accounts, 
a news article, we have this kind of a background empathy, so we know what they're talking about, those adults. Uh, next slide. And um, here's another one that shows the variability of prices. Um, we, I have them trade gift certificates, which have more or less value, and we can see how in a community trade can increase the value, even though there's no new stuff there. So what was basically worthless to somebody after a trade, it's, there's two things that are worth more. So the group benefits um, from trade. And then you can, with that background, again, turn to the you know, real life adult situations and they have a some sense of what that actually means. And next slide. Um, board games are an excellent way to understand money supply. If they're playing Monopoly, which 10 to 13 year olds in, in my area seem to know amazingly how to play, they love to play it. Um, there are also some budgeting board games you can get, pretty simple. But if they're used to playing a game and you say, well, what would happen if I double the amount of money in the game? Um, and they think about it for a little while and makes sense. At some point, we're like, well, the prices would go up and nobody would actually have anything more. So just giving somebody money in a group doesn't always, doesn't solve poverty, really. Um, and next slide. This, I just left this on here. Um, this is through the, um, the C3 breakdown of what economics is. And it's just a reminder that it's not all numbers. It's about decision making. It's about exchange. It's about um, economy over time and um, decisions between among countries. And there's one more slide. One more slide, please. And this is just a list of some of the types of topics, the big ideas that uh, we cover in the Middle East. And may have run well over my time, but I am done. And so I turn it back to you, uh, Sam. Liberty, could I just say that those are some fantastic ideas? Um, oh, thank you. Well, well done. Great ideas. Okay, so Sam, we're back on to you. And we're right here. Okay, um, so next slide, Steve. Uh, okay, one more, got it. Okay, so um, for the, oh, there we go, that's good. So for the um, uh, second half of our content today, we wanted to talk about the politics of the region. And again, we have a prior knowledge quiz of sorts, so here's a few questions to think about. Uh, so first question, compared to other regions, the Middle East is the most undemocratic slash authoritarian region in the world. Think about it for a second. Decide if that's true, false, you're not sure. And next slide, Steve. So these are our results from four months ago. Uh, notice that, again, I think the uh, trick question uh, radar was going off on a lot of people. Uh, more than two-thirds, or about two-thirds, said this is, this is false. We're going to come back to this, uh, but it's probably actually true, uh, and we'll talk more about the reasons for that. Uh, next slide. Islamic law envisions a theocracy, making Islam incompatible with democracy. So think about that for a moment. Is that true? Uh, next slide, Steve. And this is a result from four weeks ago. Uh, next one again also. Can we get uh, the numbers to show up on the right? Or maybe, or maybe go back. Sorry, go back, Steve. I don't know why the, the right one didn't appear. So you can see that 70% uh, said false. They have some suspicion here that Islamic law is incompatible with democracy. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. I'm sure many students though, might have this impression, um, especially if they're older and have been hearing about political Islam and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, compared to other regions, the Middle East is the most violent region in the world. Think about that. Okay, next slide. And this is the results. Uh, again, the suspicion is going off. Uh, false, nine, which is about what is that, 45%. Um, so I'm not sure there's a lot of them. Uh, we'll come back to this question as well. And next slide. Last one. The Arab Spring began in 2010 because of the possibilities of social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Think about it. And next slide. So about 50% said true. Um, this is definitely talked a lot about in the, in the media. Uh, certainly Twitter and Facebook were primarily discussed. Um, a lot of political scientists are skeptical of this explanation. Um, it certainly played a role, but was it the cause? Of course, this goes back to the perpetual, perpetual question of our history teachers. You know, what was the cause of World War I? And you have that deep causes and proximate causes and that sort of thing. We'll unpack this a little bit later, hopefully, if we have time. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's start off with the first question, which is the issue of uh, how democratic or authoritarian is the region, and more importantly, why? So uh, if you turn to the next slide, 
Um, this is an interesting comment that was made in the Arab Human Development Report so by the United Nations. Uh, this is back in 2002, it's a bit dated, um, but it has a very telling statement, and I'll read it, I'll read it to you, next slide. Uh, this is page two, it says, there's a substantial lag between Arab countries and other regions in terms of participatory governance. The wave of democracy that transformed governance in most of Latin America and East Asia in the 1980s and Eastern Europe and much of Central Asia in the late 1980s and early 1990s has barely reached the Arab state. Um, and we can get a sense of this with a more recent statistic. Um, this is an index produced by The Economist, the magazine. Next slide. Um, you can see here, this is our list of uh, democracies in rank order from the most democratic to the least democratic. Norway, those Scandinavian countries, they always do so well. Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Denmark, way at the top. Um, so take a look here, and this is the top 20 countries in the world in terms of how democratic they are. Note how many Muslim countries, or excuse me, how many uh, Middle Eastern countries are in the list. Take a look. Hopefully you notice the answer is zero. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of a problem. Uh, there are no Middle Eastern countries in the top 20. Uh, in fact, uh, the closest you'll get is Jordan, which is sort of listed like a, a uh, you know, semi-democracy a little bit further down in the ranking. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, there we go. This is by region, and if you can take a look here, which region in the world is the least democratic according to their index? Take a look. And hopefully you can see Middle East and North Africa has the lowest democracy index average of any region of the world, down in the mid-threes. Uh, even Sub-Saharan Africa is in the mid-fours. Um, so this raises the question, how did this happen? What's going on? I'll give you a few more indicators just orally, and we'll talk about some of the reasons for this. So a few of the things that are worth keeping in mind. So the majority of Middle Eastern states are below average in terms of the quality of their bureaucracy, as measured by various think tanks. Um, most of them have a problem with extremely powerful executive branches that are buttressed by security states. Um, they have the, uh, a very large number of states that have modified their constitutional term limits for presidents. It happened in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen. It has a problem with political parties being regulated. Uh, this happens to be the case. You have to be approved by the government to have a political party in Egypt, Yemen, Tunisia, and Jordan. The Gulf states ban political parties. Um, almost all the states requires newspapers to be licensed. Uh, there's been a state of emergency in Syria since the 60s, in Egypt, in Algeria, in Iraq, uh, in Palestine, Israel. Uh, there's a city, um, West Bank area, uh, Sudan. Uh, most of these states regularly torture prisoners. Um, it's a pretty bad state. Now, why is this the case? What happened? Um, this is an interesting question, and uh, if you had asked this question you know, 50 years ago, you might have gotten some rather unpolitically correct answers. Uh, so next slide, Steve. Um, take a look at this, this individual display also of this problem. Um, one of the answers that was thrown out uh, in previous decades is that maybe the problem is Islam. Uh, maybe the problem is that Islam is an inherently patriarchal religion, according to the argument, and therefore it habituates young Middle Eastern people into having patriarchal household structures, and you know, therefore needing a strong patriarchal figure to run the country as well, and that sort of explains everything, sort of a cultivist argument. Um, this, uh, so one sec, Steve. Um, this argument has generally fallen out of favor. Uh, the reason is that it doesn't really fit the data very well. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and actually, my slides are a little off, so I'm gonna come back to that point in a second. Actually, maybe skip ahead two slides, Steve. Skip past this, uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. One more. Yes, keep going. Okay, here's a list here. Um, this is a continuing our, our Economist 2015 listing. Um, notice here, as we go further down the list, uh, Indonesia, ranked number 49, uh, is a sort of relatively middle-level functioning democracy. And you know, if Islam is the reason why the region has problems with, with this, this doesn't really make sense, because Indonesia is the Muslim world's largest country, most populous country, and right after is Argentina and Brazil, two prominent Catholic countries, so it doesn't really make sense. I mean, you have like sort of traditionally Christian countries at the top of the list, but then underneath Indonesia, many more. It doesn't seem to really be a religious thing per se. Uh, so what else could it be? Um, keep going, Steve, next slide. Um, one thing that uh, scholars prominently point to or commonly point to is the legacy of colonialism, and in particular, the kinds of states that were left behind. So it should not be forgotten that significant portions of the region were all colonized, so from left to right, we have the French presence in Northwest Africa, you can see Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, uh, the Italians took Libya, uh, the famous movie you might have seen um, that was dramatized about this. Then uh, Egypt and Sudan had, were controlled by first the French and then the British, uh, and then in the Levant area, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria were all colonized, uh, Iraq as well. 
uh, many states were outside of control, so Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, they were never formally uh, made colonies, but they certainly had a lot of external influence. Uh, the uh, European powers were meddling a lot in Ottoman Turkey, for example, in the 19th century. The main thing is, when the, when the colonial powers pulled out at, after World War I or after World War II, they often left behind authoritarian regimes, uh, frequently monarchies. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the British left behind monarchies in Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, and the Gulf states. Um, it's sort of a, a non-politically correct thing to talk about, or it's certainly sensitive. Um, but you know, many of the ruling families in the Gulf, uh, the Sabah family in Kuwait, the Saud family in Saudi Arabia, if you go back far enough in the past, you can actually find how they were sort of set up and put in power. Uh, which raises problems for legitimacy when people do historical work. Um, the French left behind monarchies in Tunisia and Morocco. Um, so when you have all these monarchies that are left behind, certainly there were coups in some cases. Uh, some of these turned into republics. Um, but uh, it definitely doesn't set you off for a good start uh, on your way towards democratic regime. That's certainly one factor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other big factor is why we started with economics first is if you take a political economy approach, um, the region is quite strange. And it's quite strange in that uh, there's a whole lot of states in the region that get a lot of their income, that is to say the government budget, a lot of the government budget does not come from taxes. It comes from what they call rent, uh, that is to say money derived from non-taxes. So take, take the case of the Gulf states. Many of them get most of their operating budget from oil. Uh, other states get it from additional places as well, for example, Egypt. Uh, Egypt gets money from oil some, but also American aid is a function of peace treaties that were made and a lot of tolls off the Suez Canal. Uh, in the case of Syria, they get money a little bit from oil and also bribes from various regional powers. They're trying to get them to sort of not create too much havoc, although they certainly aren't making money right now. Uh, Jordan also gets a lot of money from foreign aid. So when you have a government that is getting most of its revenue not from taxes, it makes the government relatively sort of immune to the will of the people, you could say. Or rather, it can keep going even if the people hate it. Um, uh, one statistic actually states, or one, one study found, that the Middle East is the most uh, non-tax dependent region in the world. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, during the Arab uprising, how did this, the Gulf states deal with this? In many cases, they tried to buy out the people. They had such huge, vast resources of wealth coming in uh, from other sources. So for example, the Saudis gave out $130 billion of additional financial benefit in the form of social security type things, pay raises, government subsidies, to about $4,000 per person. And you can imagine in the United States if the government could just give out $4,000 to every American citizen uh, to deal with any, any discontent. So that's certainly another factor, is that you have these monarchies left behind by colonial powers. These monarchies, in many cases, were not that uh, influenced by the will of the people because they had independent sources of revenue. And the third major factor we might point to uh, is American foreign policy. So next slide. So here's a, an example of this in a picture, sort of uh, American support for various regimes in the region. Um, if you go back into the 1960s, you know, it's important for students to remember that the U.S. and the Soviet Union were engaged in an attempt to sort of court the various powers in the region. Some of them flip-flopped back and forth. Some of them were always on one side or the other. Um, but there was a general perception that authoritarian regimes were in our own interest. That is to say, they could help us with our goals in the Cold War. So think back to the Cold War. Uh, think about American interests like having access to oil, uh, preserving the state of Israel, which was for a variety of reasons. One was security, but one was also certainly ideological um, or, or religious. Uh, protecting sea lanes, maintaining stable pro-Western states, and most recently, the war on terror. Uh, and if you ask yourself, if you're a government official, you know, what kind of regime is the easiest to work with to make sure these goals are met? The answer was frequently given, authoritarian regime. Um, and some examples. So um, if you think that the region is at risk of going communist, and you want a regime that can rapidly modernize the economy to boost the, the status or the economic status of the citizens so they aren't tempted by communism, what kind of government is the best suited to rapidly modernize the country? Is it a kind of poorly functioning democracy, or is it going to be one person in charge who can sort of you know, build this and build this and build this and build this? The assumption was an authoritarian regime. Another example was if you have a very unpopular peace treaty, for example, the peace treaty with Israel, um, what kind of governmental setup is most likely to support that peace treaty when the vast majority of the citizens don't approve of it while well, in authoritarian regime? Um, what kind of regime can ensure U.S. access to oil? And what kind of regime is seen to be best at suppressing terrorists, interrogating terrorists, and that sort of thing? Uh, again, the assumption was an authoritarian regime. So uh, American support uh, took a variety of different forms. Uh, one was coups. Uh, there certainly were a few instances of this. Um, most famously, the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran in the 1950s. 
uh, democratically elected prime minister, um, which we facilitated. Uh, another was the we helped back the overthrow of the first democratically elected leader of Syria. Um, so that was a, a factor. If it wasn't as explicit as a coup, it might have been a more soft approach, uh, such as providing direct financial aid um, or military aid. And you can certainly see in the news many examples of uh, continued U.S. support, you know, selling weaponry and this sort of thing to uh, regimes in the region. Um, and, of course, that benefits us because, of course, we get billions of dollars uh, in revenue for our companies when we do that. Um, and I guess also to keep in mind here, I think, for students, is that, you know, we look at the region and we see all these authoritarian regimes, we forget how young they are. I mean, many of them are, you know, less than a century old. And our own experience in political history, I mean, the, how long has it taken the U.S. to get to where we are now, where we have full enfranchisement of women, for example, and full enfranchisement of African Americans? I mean, this took a long time. Uh, and in the case of the Gulf states or other states in the region, uh, it's still very much a work in progress. So that should be kept in mind. Um, if we can go back a few slides, I, I want to skip back, Steve. Go back to that, uh, keep going. Uh, one more, one more, uh, one more. There we go. You know, it should not be forgotten, though, that just because there's a problem with uh, democracy in the region, it doesn't mean everybody is miserable. Uh, so next slide. Um, this is sort of a happiness index that was done uh, by Gallup Polling Service. And you can see, if you compare sort of the self-reported happiness of people, they have interesting ways of getting at this, um, of people in the region. Is it as high as the United States? Uh, not really, except for some parts of the Gulf. But it's not as bad as other countries. Uh, so look at, for example, Libya. And this is um, uh, an interesting case, isn't it? Um, this data might be a little bit old, I suppose. Um, but you can see, for example, Algeria, Morocco. People are self-reporting themselves as happier in Algeria and Morocco than they are, for example, in India or in Bangladesh or in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so the, even though it's the most authoritarian region in the world, it doesn't mean it's the most miserable region in the world. That should be kept in mind. Uh, as Americans, we tend to sort of equate the two. We think that, you know, we think of ourselves as, you know, a nation of the Declaration of Independence and the pursuit of happiness and a democracy, and they all kind of get blurred together. But just because you don't have a, a, a democracy doesn't mean, you're, uh, doesn't mean you're miserable. So next slide, uh, what are some reasons for this? Um, one is certainly the GDP. Um, it is possible in many parts of the region to live a relatively comfortable lifestyle. And even if you have problems with the government, you can still uh, have food to eat and a comfortable place to live in. Um, that is one factor. Next slide. Um, another thing is that, you know, it's a very different sort of crime, uh, what's the word? Um, crime is different in the Middle East than in other parts of the world. And in the U.S., we forget we have an unbelievably high prison incarceration rate. So look at the, look at the, the legend in the bottom left. More than 700 people per 100,000 in the U.S. are incarcerated. Um, you're much less likely to go to prison if you live in the Middle East, as ours that might seem, with all the things you see in the news about uh, political prisoners and this sort of thing. Um, that's something else to keep in mind. Um, and also, uh, on the individual level, while, yes, there can be political violence and state violence, you know, in terms of your risk of actually being murdered, it's actually relatively low. So next slide. Oh, did we lose that slide? I had a homicide slide. Can I go back, see? Is it missing? Okay. Well. Um, I'll uh, take, take my word for it. Maybe we'll bump into it as we keep going. Um, the homicide rates in the region are, are quite low compared to the United States, for example. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. We could talk about this. Um, it certainly would be tied to the generally lower prevalence of drug abuse in the region, which is probably connected to uh, Islamic prohibitions on alcohol and drugs. Um, not to say that people don't abuse them in the region, but uh, in general, it tends to be lower. So let's skip, skip forward again. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Okay, violence in the Middle East. Um, so a couple of things to mention here. Um, you know, I think with, with students, they often associate the region with violence. Uh, usually when they, they catch any TV clips uh, of the region, you know, in media, it's usually there's a war is going on or some sort of aerial bombardment happening, or people are protesting in the street and something is burning or guns are being fired or something like this. Um, and this gives a very distorted perception of what it actually is like there. Um, and I remember when I was living uh, in Jordan and my parents would be watching, you know, the TV news, they would call me up and ask me, you know, like, am I seeing the people in the streets and this and that? And I'd say, what are you talking about? Everything's fine. <laughs> so you should always be remembered that, you know, the TV gives sort of a distorted picture. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, global peace index. So, you know, how uh, violent free is the region or how peaceful is the region? You can see um, it definitely has pockets that are very low uh, in terms of peacefulness. You can see Iraq and Syria are not nice places to be. Afghanistan and Pakistan also have problems. Um, but there are other parts that are comparable to the United States. So Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Morocco, 
If you live there, according to the GPI, it might be a comparable experience to the U.S. Next slide. Here we go. Here's my homicide rate chart. Uh, so if you look here, um, so the United States, sort of a light blue, the, the redder it is, the more homicides per 100,000 people. And you can see that there are several states in the region that have lower homicide rates than the U.S. So Morocco, Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, many of the Gulf states, uh, Yemen. You know, if you watch the news, you would think Yemen's a horrible place, but it has actually comparable rates in the states. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when talking with your students. Next slide. Uh, now, political violence is a problem. So while it might uh, not be an issue at the level of sort of uh, you know, someone in your neighborhood or someone trying to rob you or perform some kind of assault, um, there is political violence, and you can see that the numbers are quite bad in the region. Next slide. It's also worth keeping in mind an historical perspective. I think students, sometimes students forget this. Um, you know, students often have a kind of uh, essentialism where they sort of project the, the present situation back in time sort of endlessly as if people in one place are always the same. This is an interesting chart that was generated. Um, basically, if they took a whole bunch of historical battles that have taken place, like 12,000 total, they put a dot on the, on the map for every place the battle took place uh, up until the year 1800. And you can see that until relatively recently, until the eve of colonialism, by comparison to Europe, the region was relatively free of wars. And that's something to keep in mind also with your students, is that the, the perception of the region as uh, full of war and then Europe as sort of, you know, <laughs> absent in war. I mean, it's funny, like, for, for teachers who are older, they remember, like, World War, you know, World War II was a recent memory or World War I is a recent memory. For many students now, they're old, old, old history, um, but that hasn't always been the case. Next slide. And next slide. Okay. Another thing that comes up, we had a prior knowledge question about this. You know, is one of the reasons why um, uh, there's a lack of uh, democracy in the region a function of Islam, or is there an inherent contradiction between Islam and democracy? And the argument usually goes something like this. Uh, well, you know, Islam wants a Sharia. Sharia is sort of a God-given law, but democracy is a human-made law. So how can you have a system, I mean, where you have a God-given law, which people trying to make law, it's inherently incompatible, it can never possibly work. Um, and, you know, it might sound like it makes sense at first. Next slide. And here's an example. You certainly find plenty of talking heads on TV. Here's a YouTube video I found, a TV interview. Uh, the caption is, Islam Sharia law is incompatible with democracy. And you can see the talking head there. I'm going to try to explain why. I mean, this is very problematic uh, because if you think about the actual business of governance, uh, it's not so straightforward. So next slide. Here's a good example. Um, here's the U.S. budget. Healthcare, 25%. Social security, 24%. Um, any country has to decide what these allocations should be. Now, if you, happen to have, if you happen to live in a country where the majority of the population is Muslim or even want to have Islam as somehow part of the, uh, the Constitution, as was the case with Egypt when they did their new Constitution, what does Muhammad have to say about the percentage of your budget that should be spent on health care? I mean, there's no verse in the Quran that says, you know, the amount of health care in the budget, annual budgetary allocation should be 24.6%. I mean, there's nothing like this at all. These are general things that have to be adjudicated from general values in the society. So if Muslim society values, you know, taking care of the poor or taking care of the sick, that would certainly maybe influence how much money is allocated to health care. But it certainly doesn't, you know, fix that. And so much of what democracies do is debating these kinds of things. You know, should we have the Affordable Care Act, for example, in the United States? That's not really a religious issue in an explicit sense. Uh, next slide. Another example. You know, we have all these laws. Most laws in the United States that have nothing to do with religion. What should the speed limit be on this highway? Should it be 55 miles an hour? Should it be 65 miles an hour? That's not something you're going to find an Islamic edict about. Um, so while it's true that there are some famous examples of uh, legislation that are prescribed in the Quran, uh, which have, uh, uh, you know, for punishments for specific things, for example, famously, uh, there's a verse in the Quran which talks about the chopping off of hands for theft, um, and people often think about that when they think about the question of Islamic democracy. That is but one law out of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of laws that the government has most of which have nothing to do whatsoever with religion. We'll talk more about the issue of uh, Islamic punishment a little bit in our discussion of religion in our third webinar. Um, so next slide. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, just because you can have a scriptural reference that seems to have some bearing on law, that doesn't mean that it necessarily translates directly into a law. You still have to figure out how to do the interpretation. And democracies can be a place where the public decide how a scripture should be interpreted. So here's an example. Here's a, a nice ad I found. Uh, this, the ad says, smoking is haram, meaning smoking is pr prohibited or forbidden. Um, and what's the proof text they offer? Here's chapter 4 of the Quran. Nor kill or destroy yourselves, for verily Allah hath been to you most merciful. 
So you can think about it. Are there other ways of reading that verse that don't require the prohibition, the illegal prohibition of smoking? Well, I mean, certainly uh, the argument would go if you smoke regularly, it might lead to someone dying of lung cancer. But it's not like the minute you put a cigarette in your mouth, you immediately die. I mean, it's not an act of suicide to smoke a cigarette. Um, so that is my way of saying that uh, the question of does this verse mean that we can't allow people to smoke, that's a question that has to be adjudicated by people who might disagree and what's a natural place for disagreement to be worked out in a democracy. So um, this idea which sometimes floats around that should really be pushed back against. And I might also mention here, next slide. Um, you know, we often forget that a lot of the democracies that we have in the Western world do have an official church relationship. Uh, so, for example, the Queen of England, um, in church canon law states, quote, we acknowledge that the Queen's most excellent majesty, acting according to the laws of the realm, has the highest power under God in this kingdom and has supreme authority over all persons and all causes, as well, uh, as well ecclesiastical as civil. Um, and she's sometimes called the defender of the faithful. Um, so here's a country most of us would never doubt the democratic credentials of the United Kingdom, and yet here they have an official tie with the church. Um, and so there's no reason why a Muslim country couldn't have a comparable type of setup. Next slide. Okay. Um, now we can turn to uh, the question of the causes of the Arab uprising. And notice I haven't called them the Arab Spring. Um, sometimes you might hear that word thrown around. Uh, a lot of political scientists are pushing back on that for the simple reason that it hasn't really <laughs> been very spring-like. Uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunately in many situations outside of possibly Tunisia, uh, things have gotten a lot worse. Uh, so we'll call it the Arab Uprising. What are some of the deep causes? Uh, next slide, Steve. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind uh, is a concept that you sometimes hear uh, in uh, amongst political scientists called the ruling bargain. Uh, and the idea is that basically uh, there was a deal sort of struck, you might say, in the 1960s, that uh, these states in the region, many of which were authoritarian in nature, would sort of provide a bargain with their people. That is to say, they would give them all kinds of social benefits in exchange for a certain degree of acquiescence. So what kinds of things we're talking about? Uh, employment guarantees, um, if you can believe this, Egypt used to guarantee every high school graduate a job, which, which is amazing, the government would. We end up having all these people working in the government not doing very much but drinking tea. Um, guaranteed health care, guaranteed education in Egypt. You have free college at Cairo University, for example, and also subsidized consumer goods. So, for example, uh, in Egypt, you would have something like 20% of the economy going to subsidize consumer goods for people, which is a huge amount of money. Imagine if the U.S. government spent 20% of our budget subsidizing grocery budget, grocery store items. Um, now, why were they doing this? Uh, in part, it was because of U.S. encouragement. Um, in the 1960s, um, there was an idea that this was sort of uh, being the, the, the best sort of model for uh, economic development, very typically advocated for by the IMF and the World Bank. Um, it also made sense sort of a post-colonial context. Think about, you know, we had this colonial power outside ruling for its own interests, I don't want to rule for the interests of the people. What do the people need? They need education, they need healthcare, and these sorts of things. And this thing was paid for in part uh, through the tremendous success of oil. You look at this chart here, you can see um, so the, the price of oil going up and up and up and up and up. It was quite remarkable. Um, and when the price of oil is high, you, you can afford to offer all these things to your, to your citizens. And then you might say, well, wait a minute, this only applies to Gulf states. What about other states that don't have oil? But even they benefited. So, uh, next slide. You can see here a very common thing that happened was remittances. That is to say, you had states like Saudi Arabia with these massive building programs, and then people would go from Egypt or from Jordan or from Syria to work in Saudi Arabia, and they would send back massive amounts of money in the form of you know, donations for their family. Um, and that, so that money in Saudi Arabia sort of trickled out. The so oil money went out, the, out of the region, the Pakistan and India certainly, but also within the region. An analogy you might use with your students is the case of you know, people from Central America or from Mexico. Um, working in the United States, many of them send large amounts of money back to their home countries. It's a multi-billion dollar a year uh, business for transfer. The problem is, go back, if we go back again, uh, see the previous slide, um, you can see here that uh, going up and up and up in the 1970s and the 1980s, it peaked shortly around 1980 with the uh, beginning of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and then the price comes down. And the problem that price comes down is that the governments are no longer able to pay for all these social benefits they've been offering. And you have to imagine what the political consequences are going to be when you're an authoritarian regime and you, pre you, you predicated your legitimacy on your ability to provide for your people and you're no longer able to do it. Um, and so as a consequence of that inability to pay, 
combined with sort of rise of neoliberalist economic policies, the idea that uh, government should not be in the business of providing all these social benefits, and of course the U.S. and the IMF and the World Bank are pushing a new approach to finance. Um, many of these countries begin to back off. So in an effort to balance their budget, they take back subsidies, for example, uh, Egypt uh, cut back their subsidies and the price of bread went up 50%. So next slide. Uh, next slide again. And you can see here, um, you know, you can imagine people sort of waiting in line for bread. If the price of bread goes by 50 percent, it could be very problematic. In the case of Egypt, when this happened, uh, they had two days of bloody rioting. 80 to 100 people died, 1,000 were arrested. There were riots when this happened in comparable uh, situations of removing subsidies in Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, Algeria, and Jordan. Um, another thing that happened in the 1980s was what people call crony capitalism. Uh, the idea basically being that uh, if the government is in charge of all of these, you know, sort of things that could be privatized, and if you go to privatize it, who gets control over these private corporations? Um, it was frequently people somehow allied with the regime, so it could be family members. As an example, uh, Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, his son got, uh, his son's friend got 60% of the steel industry. I mean, how does that happen? Well, the government controls the steel, give it to somebody, but you don't give it to, you know, the highest, you know, the highest investor or something, it goes to a family member. Um, in the case of the Assad regime, Assad's cousin got 55% of the telecommunications market. Um, this is unbelievable. Um, and I should also ask Steve, how are we doing on time? I should probably wrap this up soon, shouldn't I? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up here. So um, this is one thing to keep in mind. So in, in the years leading up to the Arab Spring, a lot of things had been happening which were increasing resentment of the people. Namely, you had authoritarian regimes no longer able to provide the things that had previously given them legitimacy. Next slide. Um, and here's an interesting perspective on this. So do high food prices cause social unrest? And you can see here, uh, the food price index is in red, and the count of news stories about social unrest is in blue. And you can see a rough sort of general correlation. And you can see also the rise of food prices all throughout the 2000s, going up and up and up and up and up. So while it's certainly true that, you know, Facebook and Twitter, you know, were played a role in how the Arab uprisings unfolded, that's not to say they were the cause per se. And something like this, I think, is much easier to point to as the uh, deep cause of the uprising. Next slide. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to get to this in a second here. Um, I guess one thing I also want to mention before we go uh, to this picture um, is that uh, there have been climactic factors as well. Uh, one thing to keep in mind that the region, as you know, uh, is generally fairly arid. Yes, there are times of the year when water does fall, uh, but overall uh, it's a relatively arid region. And only two countries in the whole region are food self-sufficient, Syria and Saudi Arabia. And even Saudi Arabia is backing off and it might not even be self-sufficient anymore. It might be importing again. Um, when the U.S. started devoting a lot of its cropland to biofuel, uh, what was the consequence? A lot of our grain came off the market, and then the price went up. And when the price went up, it also impacted people's ability to buy food. That's something else to keep in mind. Also, climate change, uh, the Russian harvest went down or by about 40% because of a heat wave. And when that happens, again, the price goes up. And this impacts people that are, have a huge percentage of their, of their family budget going towards food. Um, I'm actually worried about time here because we still have uh, not much. I have other things I wanted to mention. Um, maybe let's mention the last thing here. Um, yeah, let's just, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just I'll conclude on this point. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind uh, when we look at the region, I think about the Arab uprising, is that we have what is generally referred to as weak political structures. That is to say, um, you know, in the West, generally speaking, when the people are dissatisfied with a political party or a political candidate, they vote them out of office. Uh, and then that candidate leaves, and then the other party takes over, and you have some sort of general accountability mechanism. Um, I suppose in the, the recent Clinton-Trump runoff, that's been called into question a little bit with Trump saying he's not sure if he'll endorse or wins. wins. Um, that's definitely an anomaly in American political history. Um, but nonetheless, there's a general idea that we can work out our problem. Uh, in the case of the region, it's interesting to think about what one of the big slogans was. And the slogan in Arabic was, Ashaf yurid ashaf nizam, which means something like, the people re want the, the removal of the regime. And this word nizam, translated as regime, sort of means the whole thing. There was an idea uh, that was common that uh, it's not simply one person that's corrupt or one uh, party that's a problem. The whole system is a problem. Um, and so uh, that's something to keep in mind. You know, there were similar political unrests that were happening in Greece, for example, recently in Europe as a function of austerity measures. There were also tied to economic problems. But, um, you know, Greece's uh, uh, 
democratic institutions were able to deal with it better uh, than uh, the Middle East was. So I'm going to stop here and I'm turn it over to my colleague. Okay, Miriam, you are up. All right. Hi, hello, my name is Erin Wardock, and I am a social studies teacher at Hall High School. I teach modern world history, which is um, a freshman course, and uh, American government, and AP American government. And, um, you know, you can always touch upon um, the politics in the Middle East uh, in both classes. So I have, I've decided that I was going to do things a little differently with this. Um, I've went through all my resources and I pulled out probably the six of the um, most effective um, and most useful resources that I think that teachers would want. Um, that's something that I've always heard and even within my colleagues and, and our data team that we're always looking for resources. So um, next slide, please. Um, we're going to start off with the first website. Uh, it's the Global Connections. This is the PBS site. Um, this is pretty uh, exciting to use because there's three different um, uh, categories that have been useful. Um, and what I've done is I've just circled a couple of uh, key things and it's just uh, will explain how I've used them uh, in my classrooms. So the first thing is the timeline. Then we see explore a theme and connecting questions. The exploring the theme piece of it, I'll go into a little more detail uh, in the next slide, please. Um, here, what we have is uh, they've listed just a few different themes, politics, religion, culture, geography, science and technology, and economics. And here, what you do is you get access to background information. This background information is good for the teachers, it's good for the students. You can uh, have students, and when we talk about higher level thinking, you can have students read the background information and develop uh, essential questions for that. You can also develop questions for students uh, while they're reading the background um, information. The other good thing about this is, is that uh, underneath the background information, uh, and I believe the timeline, uh, they'll give you more resources. So again, as a teacher, you're always looking for resources to be able to use with your students that are applicable and, and age appropriate. Next slide, please. This slide um, is the connecting questions. Um, this is, uh, for example, politics from royalty to democracy. And in each of these, uh, 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 sections of the website, you have a few different things. You've got some related topics. Again, they've got essential questions that you can use. So, for example, how were the modern nation states of the Middle East created? Uh, what role have natural resources played in the politics and the economy of the Middle East? You also have um, lesson plans on the side. And again, these are resources that you can use. So, you've got maps. You have, uh, there's something else I thought was interesting. Oh, got water. So you look at the water crisis and what does that mean for uh, people living in the Middle East and per region and per country, they're different. And, and then you, you can have that conversation about politically, what is this, uh, the implications of, of water. Uh, next slide, please. Again, so this is the connecting questions. They're essential, or they're, they're guided questions, I would say. And I think you, you can, go a little further and create essential questions for each one of them. But again, uh, background information for both teachers and students, a very detailed timeline, and again, a variety of different lessons. So for this one, it's the nation states um, uh, connecting question, and what they have is the mapping of the Middle East, a meeting of world leaders, an Israeli-Palestinian peace summit, and these are lesson plans that you can use uh, with your students. Um, the next, next slide, please. Next website, um, it comes from the Center for Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Chicago, um, and it's uh, the Oriental Institute. Um, here, again, you have access to uh, resources. Again, you look at the foundations, historical perspectives, and the classroom connections. Uh, so here, in terms of politics, we're looking at rulership and justice and empires to nation states again. Next slide, please. Here are the historical perspectives. Uh, you can use the site as a web quest with your students. Um, you can use the perspectives to have students develop a timeline. You can have students trace the evolution of the nation state using the various perspectives. Uh, and you could also just use it as background information. Next. So here, um, 
again, resources, which I found to be incredibly helpful. Um, this has to do with the Empire State Nation States, and you are looking at uh, background information, so you've got this essay, Introduction, The Age of Empire, and The Rise of Nation States. You can provide, you can actually have the students uh, write an essay or a DBQ by looking at the uh, question, has there been a clash of civilization between the Middle East and the West? And then you also have learning resources, and they circle the primary sources there because we, you know, in our social studies classes, we always want to make sure that we have primary and secondary sources for our students to engage in inquiry. Next slide, please. So just to look at the primary sources here, um, it gives you a little, um, uh, each one actually is a link to the actual source that you may use in the classroom. And again, um, you know, uh, uh, the sources are available and as well as uh, maps too. So um, those are all, these are all the sources you can gather and have the students uh, write uh, a DBQ. Next sentence, and I'm sorry, next slide. Here again uh, is that question, has there been a clash of civilizations between the Middle East and the West? That's a guided question. There's some brief background information. And then underneath it, again, supporting links, these are the sources that you can give your students um, to write their DBQ. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sure many of you guys have heard of the Choices Program. They've got great resources for teachers. Um, in their you know complete choice series but what some teachers don't know is that you can actually get free lessons uh, you sign up uh, you can send your email uh, there's a sign up and you get this uh, lesson plan at least once a month um, and it's teaching with the news and i find these to be incredibly useful in the classroom next slide please so here you have a debating the U.S. response to Syria. Right next to it says join our mailing list. This is where I get all the lessons sent to me. Uh, so free emails, uh, lessons are emailed. You have um, interactive role play, and we know that the choices programs offer that option at different various levels, but they're, they're known for their interactive role playing. Um, more resources, there's handouts that are principal, and again, these are so, useful uh, with your students, and then uh, any type of multimedia. Usually there are videos, short videos that you can have the students uh, watch um, in the classroom, or if, again, if you're gonna be doing this as a, a homework assignment, they have access to that. Next, please. So here is uh, Egypt's uprising. Um, so world history, you, you can use, um, so Crane, uh, Brinton has this anatomy of the revolution. You usually use it with, you know, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and you can actually even use it towards uh, this, um, uh, the Egyptian uh, uprising. Um, and in history and government classes, uh, I've done a compare and contrast of the U.S. Revolution and the Egyptian, um, you know, as they call it, the Arab Spring. Um, so you've got that option. Uh, again, you have printable sources, political cartoons, um, and then, again, if you want to flip your classroom and have the students watch these videos for homework, uh, you can have the students do that. Next slide, please. Uh, many people know about the New York Times website. Uh, there is uh, this blog, learning blog for teachers. And so here is um, one lesson you use. In, they, you use New York Times articles. Uh, in the classrooms, so, and they provide it for you. And what they do is they usually give you focus questions. You can have them, um, you know, use that in the classroom for discussion, um, as well as more resources available uh, pertaining to the topic. Next slide, please. So um, we've seen a lot of great maps and Sam, uh, between this presentation and last week's uh, webinar, there are wonderful maps that you can actually use in the classroom. Um, and the National Archives has a, a number of different worksheets, and this one is a map analysis worksheet, but there's also some for like political cartoons and primary sources and secondary sources that are, that are already made and the questions are really effective and good uh, with our students. Um, so, you know, you've got that option as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Amnesty International USA has uh, a number of different um, curriculum 
uh, pertaining to specific books or human rights violations. I use this uh, with my world history class. I use snippets of the Kite Runner, and uh, this curriculum is uh, phenomenal, actually, to complement it. And then what I do is I usually follow up with the video or pieces of the, vi of the movie uh, in class. Next slide, please. So here you get just a quick overview of the Kite Runner here, uh, what lessons uh, are broken down. I, what I love about this in particular is, is that it goes into the different ethnic groups and, um, and within Afghanistan. And, you know, ethnicity and ethnic groups and tribal groups are so important throughout the Middle East um, because they influence the economics, they influence uh, the political structure of many of the different countries. Next slide, please. Um, just to show you again here is just uh, uh, how useful that curriculum is, is that they, they even provide uh, these definitions for our students so they have a better understanding of what they're reading uh, because, you know, maybe they don't know what a warlord is or what a mini state is or guerrilla warfare. So this helps them uh, with background information and reading comprehension. Uh, this is the last site. Next, please. I'm sure many of you guys know this, the New Zealand website. This is pretty uh, fascinating as well. You sign up, it's free. You use your school uh, domain to uh, log in or you can use your own Gmail account to log in. And here, uh, here's just a quick overview of sanctions. And even though this particular article deals with um, Russia, uh, these, this is still the same concept of what sanctions are because a lot of our students really don't know what that is. Uh, you can then apply it towards, uh, you know, the sanctions, for example, in Iran. Um, the great thing about this is, is that it's broken down by Lexile level, so your students would be able to access the article uh, based on their reading ability. Uh, you're engaging with the text by, uh, if you click on the right, um, well, not on this, but when you access this website, there's a little uh, icon for right, and it allows the students to engage with the particular article that they're reading. Um, so it's sort of like a dialectic journal, but in um, uh, the website. And then, you know, for reading comprehension, you can always give them a quiz or have the students quiz themselves on what if they understood what they read. Uh, lastly, the really cool thing about this site is, is that you can also connect it with your Google Classroom. Um, so, yes, I, I hope those were helpful, and I, um, I know I had to rush through them, but that's, you have access to these sites. Miriam, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And um, all of the, I think Sam uh, with the historical overview and Liberty and Miriam both with ideas, uh, all very, very useful and very helpful. Um, we're a little over today, so I think we're going to end. We're at about an, um, 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 an hour and eight minutes or so. So um, hopefully this has been helpful to you and enjoyable to you. We will be doing our next webinar uh, next Thursday, our third in the series. And could somebody remind me what the topics are for next week? Uh, next week we're talking about the society of the Middle East, that is to say the social groups uh, and also the religions of the Middle East, uh, emphasizing Islam and also Judaism, Christianity, and a little bit of Zoroastrianism. So that's what's upcoming. Uh, you'll get the links uh, on Tuesday, and uh, hope to see everybody next week again. Uh, thanks for being part of this, and have a good afternoon. Thank you.